Uh, you wrote a piece a couple weeks ago where you said that in order for resistance to work, uh, Democrat, uh, you know, organizers basically need to ditch the establishment, uh, establishment Democrats. And we had this DNC chair race that happened over the weekend. And I, I want to just lay out a couple of caveats because I do think that everybody of all persuasions, there's way too much of an outrage culture. And I don't actually know in actuality, like, Tom Perez and Keith Ellison, I clearly and distinctly preferred Keith Ellison, but I don't... Th this actually, in fact, wasn't even Bernie versus Hillary. Ke uh, the, the nod from the establishment perspective is that Tom Perez is a liberal part of the establishment, and he did do some very good things on civil rights, on labor enforcement, and everything else, right? But at the same time, it clearly was another nod that the powers that be presently in the Democratic Party, and I don't think it's just ideological, I think it's, you know, making sure the right people get consulting contracts, are not comfortable with even a kind of like soft liberalism that has some genuine kind of grassroots uh, emphasis. Uh, so, I, you know, I want your read on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say this. It was a proxy battle between yeah. different wings of the party. And Tom Perez was a person that, the kind of Obama Clinton establishment wing put forward. Right. Out of all the people they could have put forward, he was in many ways one of the least odious. Yep. You know, they, yep. they knew they couldn't provoke us too much. Right. Which is a sign of progress. Right. But, you know, nonetheless, I, I, I don't buy the reading that, you know, Perez and Ellison have a lot of the same program because to begin with, um, Ellison was laying out kind of an alternative vision of a different sort of um, DNC, one that kind of, encouraged and helped feed into the kind of this resistance we're seeing to Trump when they had this kind of left populist alternative, you know, one that was just more combative and, you know, just encourage people to actually get involved at a deeper level than what we've seen. Yep. Perez, I think, at least from what I've heard, you know, I've listened to multiple interviews, but I haven't dissected every word that he said during the DNC race. I was offering a, a far more kind of contained, lots of kind of platitudes about, you know, being more competitive and doing better and, and things like that without without any kind of clear, clear understanding. Um, obviously, he has connections with segments of the trade union movement through his time as labor secretary and he wasn't a bad labor secretary as far as you know, U.S. government labor secretaries go. Right. But um, but, yeah, overall, it's hard to see this as anything but the establishment of the party saying, you know, you know what, this Bernie thing is a flash in the pan. It's still our game. Mm -hmm. We're still going to handle this in 2018 and 2020. And we don't actually need to radically reshape things. You have a couple of establishment voices that I think are, you know, just for purely crassly opportunistic reasons are savvy enough to see the way things are going. Like Chuck Schumer, you know, this guy, if, if you live in New York, you know, you know, one thing about Chuck Schumer is that he goes to wherever the kind of crowds are. He goes to wherever the cameras are, you know, and, and he himself is, is a, where, where direction the kind of tides are going. But right. it's telling that Chuck Schumer knew to embrace the Bernie wing of the party. Yep. It's telling that he knew to in, endorse Allison. Right. But, um, you know, I think he's the exception in the Democratic um, establishment. These people aren't just going to kind of roll over and and, you know, give Bernie the. Um, and his people, the party. So I think we need to think seriously about what it would mean to, you know, wage the kind of war against Trump while also making a two front conflict against um, huge segments of the Democratic, um, you know, party establishment, which not aren't only aren't going to effectively beat Trump, but I think we're seeing are going to actually oppose these developments with the, within the party. They want different tactics compared to 2016. They want a few different tweaks but they don't actually want a fundamentally different vision. Right. So actually, and we'll, we'll get into that, but let, let's, speaking of just sort of platitudes, um, let's, let's listen. And I, I agree with you. I, I have no problem with saying in context, like as an example, I was, I thought I really wanted Hillary Clinton to pick Tom Perez as her VP, right? Like if he was her VP, that would have been an actual material difference from the misery of Tim Kaine. Um, but it's always this sort of too late pattern because I agree with you that there is a proxy dimension of this. But this is, uh, let's just take a brief listen to uh, Tom Perez's acceptance speech. And I think, you know, Bashkar, whatever else we say about Tom Perez, 
I think we both have to acknowledge that he is an electrifying orator. Or not. We need a chair who can not only take the fight to Donald Trump, make sure that we, we uh, talk about our positive message of inclusion and opportunity and talk to that big tent of the Democratic Party. We also need a chair who can lead, turn around, and change the culture of the Democratic Party and the DNC. And I'll tell you, folks, culture change has a number of dimensions, and all of them are essential. We must redefine the role of the DNC so that we're not simply electing the president, but we're working to elect from the school board to the Senate in all the states and the territories from Democrats abroad, making sure we elect Democrats. And the way we do that is to build strong parties, to organize, organize, organize. Uh, I just want to say really briefly, I wish that we could completely let go of the term folks. Yeah. I know. Okay. I know. That would be that to me. If Tom Perez did that as leader of the DNC, you could Man. say that I am. If he banned that word, if you could say that I have low standards. But you know what? I would be totally supportive of his leadership. But anyways, Boshkar, go ahead. I don't know where this came from. This whole folks thing. I actually I think we another thing that we can actually blame Obama for that. I think Obama's the I, I, modern. I don't know. Folks I don't know. Guy. I think on the left, organizers no longer wanted to say things like workers. Hmm. But they also did because they made them seem to kind of fit Karen and out of touch, right? Right. But they That's also didn't want to, like, I don't know, they wanted something that still had kind of a radical twinge. Mm. So they went back and they're kind of like Woody Guthrie days. You know, they pulled, <laughs> they pulled out some, like, you know. Woody Guthrie. Um, but, like, working folk want an alternative. I'm like, yeah, working folk don't call themselves working folk. Uh, and neither yeah. do the masses. The masses don't call themselves the masses. Right. We should probably retire that one, too. I would say yes. But I mean, in those sort of outlines of platitudes right there, is that basically what you're talking about in terms of like the there's no intellectual infrastructure there? I'm not talking like obviously he's a smart guy, but the the same tropes, culture change, opportunity, inclusion, take the message out, organize, organize, organize and win local elections are tangible things. Those are different things. But everything else reflects a culture. And again, this goes back to, to Bannon. It, it, he's a crackpot, not, I mean, we really, I do not not want to overstate his intelligence. I don't think it's that high. But it's, a, it's the worldview of a strategist and someone with ideas versus just a PR consultant. And you can see well, that just the sort of that's the kind of still the thinking of these people. Well, well listen, I think there's different yeah. consensus. There's different wings of this kind of like neoliberal consensus, right? right? right. And Bannon captured, captured some of it when he said that, you know, they believed that we were, you know, essentially just a global marketplace, yeah. not, you know, a nation that happens to have an economy. You know, right. that, that this, like, America kind of has a reason for being outside of its economy and obviously the way he's framing this is in kind of a right wing nationalist direction but right. but it is kind of something that's value driven. And you saw this was from Bannon at CPAC. You saw the next day Trump at CPAC, you know, echo a lot of the same rhetoric and mention that he thought Bernie was right on trade. Right. Now someone like like um uh like Perez will look at that and say, Well in fact, you know, T P P or NAFTA might you know, cost us 20,000 jobs, but it'll also create 30,000 jobs. And right. he'll try to, like, right. examine this like it's just policy. It's like, but no, it's like people actually are against these things because they capture a lot of what they don't like about the last 20 or 30 years. Right. It's not the details of NAFTA. Right. No one's exactly. sitting there looking at it line by line. It's what it represents. Something new that was pushed through that helped to reshape the economy that they had no power over. They weren't right. really consulting all, over. They were just kind of like, you know, lied, lied about and told it would bring all sorts of benefits that a lot of people didn't see. And uh, so it's basically it's a difference between constructing a politics and right. then letting the policy fall into place after that. And just thinking that politics is just the accumulation of little different policy points. And, it's and at an some level. Yeah, go ahead. Finish your thought. No, at some level, I think I think guys like like Perez uh, fundamentally want policies that are, you know, help a lot of. Yeah. Ordinary people, ordinary folk, if you will. <laughs> but the thing is, they Don't have say a it very again. narrow vision of what's possible, right? right? So they actually, in fact, fundamentally believe that the best you could hope for is something slightly more even, slightly more level, 
but basically, you know, has to offer essentially social inclusion, right? Excluded right. groups are now allowed into the marketplace and hopefully make the marketplace a little bit more fair. What Trump um, offers is like an alternative value system. And to some degree, you know, it's a, it's a nasty one. Bashkar, uh, Bashkar, we're losing you. I don't know where you stepped. You know, you know what it is? You know what? It's a deep state, man. It's a deep it's state. It's a deep state. It's, I would think, yeah, it's, I was actually thinking it was for you, it was Trinidadian intelligence. Uh, you, you know what? I don't think we, I don't think we have much of, you don't think of anything. think there isn't a Trini intelligence service? I don't know, man. I, well, we, you know, you know, we did hire, um, Giuliani, uh, Giuliani as yeah. a consultant uh. and he bought this blimp. And he had this limp circle around Port of Spain to look for like <laughs> drug trafficking activity, and it was just a national joke for that a couple of years. That is the most kind of money. Giuliani thing I've ever heard. It is real. Um, so no, I I think and and that's there are two really really important points here, Bashkar, that we need to tease out because number one, I think you're you're completely right that the sort of the the neoliberal technocratic democratic you know what, whatever terminology we're using that cluster is it confuses second order questions with first order questions right like a second order question and it is a legitimate question it this is where I, you and I are also distinct obviously from the right we actually do care about how something is going to operationally and empirically work in the world right but that's not a primary motive what works isn't a primary motive. Primary motive is, you know, mass justice. Primary motive is everyone has, you know, I mean, we're talking about very basic things. Primary motive is everyone has health care, period, no nonsense, no bullshit, right? The second order questions are, well, what does it look like and how is it delivered in some respects? And I think that, you know, that is the sort of thing with, with trade is, is, even if your job was replaced, well, maybe you don't like the job that was replaced it. Or maybe even if it abstractly evens out because you're unemployed and there's nothing left in your community, but you have more purchasing power at Walmart, well, maybe you would have opted for that decision to begin, right? Like that that does not right, capture absolutely. us as full human beings, full citizens. It's just these economic abstractions that are also never going to be compelling to people other than like an incredibly small group of nerds or, or beyond that yeah. let's say if it over the course of the entire country let's say to use, use a make, made up number um, gave 50,000 jobs distributed across the country if it lost cost us 30,000 jobs in the same like three communities yeah exactly then of right. course that devastation is going to be a lot more palpable right and the palp and also like uh, 30,000 jobs that are like that's what you do and your skill is completely irrelevant now and you're destroyed and gutted in three communities versus like 50,000 new like, you know, uh, uh, trading jobs that are sprinkled across the country. That's exactly right. And I think and then that leads to the second point. And this actually you can get as explicitly as you want into a kind of Marxist analytic framework. Part of the reason I think, and, and I and I I don't know that you need like I don't I don't know where this honestly goes as a political conclusion, but I just think it's reality. It's like we're playing if you're on any version of the left, from the you know center center social democratic left to obviously a Marxist perspective. We're playing in terrain that fundamentally is synchronized with a different worldview, so. We're a capitalist system, and that you know defines so much of what we conceive of as possible, even even in our own imaginations, right? Like that's the kind of common critique. So when you have that dynamic, you can have one side where imaginations can p completely run free. Like, well, maybe what we should do is we should turn schools into private prisons, and then we can have a lottery system for kids to escape prison if they do well on a test, and then a teacher could be shot. And then, you know, like, they're, they're constantly uh, innovating Sounds like a idea. Japanese game show. It sounds like it does sound. Or, or like Betsy DeVos's new education brief, right? Like, so, and then on our side, it's like, well, maybe we can convince people that like actually again this is the inverse of nafta that 
there'll be enough offsets by giving a poor kid an inhaler that will actually end up saving money and it's okay. Versus the logic that we want to follow, which is like, no, actually, it's just that there's no, even if giving every poor kid an inhaler was a completely inefficient thing that made no sense and did not save money, it still must be done. Right, exactly. And I think part of it is we believe that changing the world and, and just at the very least creating a basic welfare state, a basic you know condition where people have access to housing and education and all the other base necessities of life is you know possible. We don't know exactly how necessarily, right? We're not writing. We, haven't, we don't have the pre-written policy points down to like 30, 40 pages. Right. But we know, we you know, richest to. country on earth, right. it's doable. It's exactly. possible. We've right. seen it done even in places that are uh, a lot, a lot poorer, you know, and a, a lot more, you know, um, you know, further behind than us. You know, we like to think of Scandinavian uh, social democracy as being this kind of like pinnacle of, of human civilization. Like, but have you like seen their cuisine? You know, these are people like who went from like, you know, eating fermented fish to providing like well-cast health care and education and, and, and things like that. So we know it's possible. In other words, we right. just like are going to figure out how to do it technically, of course, when we get to that point where we're in power. And we start, though, from explaining people our values and our politics, whereas I fundamentally believe that even if Perez shares some of this social democratic vision, at least a little bit of it, he starts with kind yeah. of um, but realism, right? Kind of mm -hmm. the prison of the, the possible. Yeah. And uh, I think that's, that's very different than, than what even Rove and some of these, these guys, and the, even the Bush White House, not even the Trump White House, were saying, um, you know, a decade ago when they were saying that they're, they create, or two decades ago, you know, they, you know they, they're going to create their own reality when they get to power. Yeah, that's exactly right. Hey, it's Sam Cedar. Why don't you uh, subscribe to this channel? You can do so right, uh, right over here. Uh, so over. Subscri subscribe.